Hello and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Jasmine and we are live at 99U, the 11th annual 99U um, in New York City. So this is awesome. I'm here with the one and only Boris Young. Hi everyone. And we are so stoked today. We are like, it's a good day in New York. It's springtime, kind of, but we're, we're excited to be here and it's going to be a rockin' conference, I think. Things are already looking really cool. What do you think? Uh, things are pretty really good. Um, vibes are above average. Yeah. I would say the weather has put people in a fantastic mood yeah. and it's a great, uh, great climate to talk about design. Absolutely. So today, well, I need to give you a little bit more of an intro. So this man right here is the head of design principal of Wolf Allens. And can you tell us about that? Just tell us about all of that. Sure, yeah, so about that. Uh, so Wolf Olins is a 53-year-old company, mm -hmm. uh, one of our first clients with the Beatles. So I think uh, in some ways we're one of the first companies to have worked with both Apples, Apple Records and the, the Apple. And I think part of what Wolf, makes Wolf Olins special is they always try to partner with transformative people, mm. right? So whether it's, you know, Bono and Bobby Schreiber calling us and saying, hey, we want to create this brand called Red and save lives. We tend to take on the briefs that either no one wants to take on <laughs> or <laughs> that, you know, maybe other people Somebody's are smart, smart, smart enough to, 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 to bob and weave these. But we partner with transformative people because we want to make a change in the world. So whether that's looking at red, whether it's the branding for the Olympics, mm -hmm. um, 53 years old, taking the narrative, I think, away from advertising and comms and giving it to the people. So I think we always try to advocate for, for people at the end of the day. And where did that stem from? Like, how did that vision come to life and say, I want this to be my business priority for most of my career? Where does that come from? Well, I think that Wolf Olin's, in some ways, um, is, a, is a child of the 60s. Um, you say child of the hippies, uh, in the sense that, uh, you know, peace, love, and happiness. But ultimately, um, really advocating for people, making sure that structures are not too hierarchical or command and control, that we try to flatten things whenever possible. And so in some ways, it created a magnetism to pull me in. So I realized yeah. that my values totally. align to the company's values. And so I thought, you know, when they called me and asked me to join, I said, of course. Yeah, no question, right? So you're doing a lot here at 99U in the next few days. So that's why I'm wearing my Smurf suit. Ah! Uh, it's, yeah. Wait, can we can we see the shoes? Just just set the tone. Oh yeah, we're gonna check out these shoes right now. Ooh, hold on. Are you guys looking at these and the socks? What? I was not prepared. That's the most uh, flexing that's going to be done uh, in this session. <laughs> so good. don't get your hopes that there's going to be no more contortioning. I think that's but all the uh, flexing we need. That, that was like, amazing. That's Thank set you. The tone. Thank you. Um, so you're going to be talking about future design. Yes. And you're doing a master class here. So yes. give us a little bit of a sneak. Like, what's going on? What are you going to do? What are we talking about? Absolutely. So I think you know a lot of thinking about future design is taking it out of an academic place and telling designers, hey, every designer is a future designer. Mm. It's just that your briefs are either three months or 300 years. Ooh. So in some ways, you know, no designers can be off the hook and saying, oh, I'm not a futurist, because you're really trying to adjust a future condition. Really, right. that's what a design brief is. And so a lot of what I try to do is um, put some kind of skin and kind of flesh out um, what does it entail to, to think about the future. Mm. Um, a lot of people believe that you can look into the future. You can see an inevitable outcome. You can say, I'm going to write a brief to have a preferable outcome within a realm of plausibility. But I think that's misleading because if we could actually see the vague outlines of the future, we would all be kite surfing. Um, <laughs> so I think the, the more realistic way to think about it is that we're probably walking backwards into the unknown, mm -hmm. looking at things that are reassuring places that we've already been, which then represents both the challenge of not bringing our biases into the future, Absolutely. but ultimately just embracing what the unknown has to offer. So it's a little bit of kind of let go versus, you know, believing that we can control and shape uh, the future within an inch of our lives. Oh yeah, you can't control mother nature. You can't control a lot of things. Oh my gosh, the chat is getting wild. I forgot about you guys, so sorry. Thank Hi. you all. Um, we got Hi, ben. Van Der, Ben, hey, we have Fazel or Fazel, I'm so sorry if I butcher that. I want XD tattoos. How do you guys know what's happening? Hi. <laughs> this thread is unbelievable. Creepy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We love you guys. Andrew, hi. Oh my God. You guys are up and just busy. I love it. New, oh, wait, wait, wait. 
Hey, BFF, you have a BFF on there? Oh my gosh, BFFs, Lee, you can totally have these shoes. We'll take this offline. <laughs> um, you have to fight me for them, though, because okay, I want unbelievable. them. <laughs> Hi, Ty. So, I mean, we have a pretty action-packed two days. Yes. So, what is the point you want to get across while you're here? Like, what is the main... We talked about a little bit of, like, what you're going to be speaking about sure, in your Better sure. Future talk. But what do you want people to leave with? Yeah, I think that um, the biggest thing, there's one thing that I would love people to leave with, is that future design should not be a chase after novelty. Hmm. But it should really be an intention towards equity. Okay, okay. So designing a future that everybody can inhabit and thrive in mm -hmm. versus certain people, whether those biases are able-bodied or geographic preference or time zone preference and yeah. so I think that's the thing a better future really is for everyone which I think is part of the Wolf Owens ethos. And what do you think are the steps to getting to that point like what are the kind of prerequisites to finding what that passion is or what that goal is and then setting yourself up for that in not only your career but kind of like your own mindset so what I can do is, uh, let's switch to my screen, yeah. and then um, I'll actually go forward to, uh, to a certain slide. So one of the things I thought was interesting when I showed up at this conference is I saw I Have Seen the Future on every single tote. Mm. And what's interesting about I Have Seen the Future is it comes from Norman Bel Geddes, who um, imagined this exhibit for the World's Fair in 1939 uh, called Futurama, in which everyone received a pen called I Have Seen the Future. But it was the last point that I think that we had a sense of optimism, true optimism, that the future was going to be better than the present moment. And so people look back to this moment in 1939 as, are we ever going to believe that the future is actually going to be better than the current moment? I would say that you know, my future design class, um, I ask everyone, who here is excited about the future? And there's maybe a half hand that really? goes up. Like, oh, guys, you're in graduate school. You have to believe that you can adjust the future. You can have some, some say in it. But I do yeah. think that there's a sense that where, no one knows where technology is going to go. No one knows where data is going to go. And so I think yeah. ultimately there should be an intentional you know, focus on, well, let's make the, the future better together. Um, this was a slide that will be in one of my master classes, which is an associate justice of the Supreme Court was asked, how do you recognize obscenity? He goes, I don't know what I'm looking for, but I'll know it when I see it. And I think that's what the future is. We can actually know what we expect to see, hopefully, but we'll know it when we see it. And I think this is another uh, you know, takeaway from my talk, which is from James Baldwin. James Baldwin, yes. Right? So if you write in order to change the world, if you alter it even by a millimeter, uh, the way people look at reality, uh, then you can change. And I think that applies to design as well. Design Absolutely. is a form of, of writing. And um, these are just a few of our kind of greatest hits, um, you know, just in terms of identity work. Um, mm -hmm. So, of course, I think a lot of you are familiar with Uber, um, the Olympics, um, NYC and SF. So I thought we'd have the two, two city, city brands up here, as well as modern fertility. And I think the most important thing about this slide is um, it's not just about giant companies. Mm -hmm. It's about ambitious companies. And it's Absolutely. about partnering with these kind of transformative leaders at an inflection point. Yeah, I mean, you got a wide range here from like Refinery29 to the Olympics. So what would you say is like, out of these brands, which one was the most challenging um, to get the point across and to do the work? And then which one was the most surprising as far as impact? So I think probably easily the Olympics was <laughs> the most <laughs> difficult project. Now, I wasn't on the Olympics team, uh, but I think it was very controversial because a lot of designers saw this as something that didn't look like an Olympics identity. Mm. Uh, they were thinking back to mm. Olympic identities of time past, but the strategy was actually incredibly sound. Probably one of our best kind of strategic projects, which was how do you create an Olympics for everyone? Oh, okay. And so the team that. really embraced the Paralympics, which mm -hmm. often get ignored in the Olympics. And so it was the most financially successful Olympics of all time mm -hmm. because we treated the Paralympics on par with the regular Olympics. And we developed an identity that was for the youth, that wasn't for the parents and the grandparents. And so there was a lot of controversy around, I don't like it, I don't like it, I don't like it, from people that are in like in my generation. But it was wildly successful, and so I think that was probably the most difficult because uh, it's only now, I think, been validated in the court of public opinion. Um, one that's been surprisingly um, 
an interesting conversation starter is dot dot. Which oh, is how... I'm actually not familiar with Dot Dot. Can you explain? <laughs> so Dot Dot was another one of these very bizarre briefs saying, okay, we have this thing called the Internet of Things. Yes. So let's all pretend that we understand what that is. <laughs> and then we want to make sure that the Internet of Things remains open and not closed. Okay. And so what we did is we actually thought, okay, well, Dot Dot is an easy way to talk about literally two devices connecting over radio. And mm. if you could explain it to a five-year-old, you would have hardware, software, Two devices connecting over radio, lo and behold, it's a face. And so, how to make the IoT feel like it's not something to be afraid of? But we oh. wanted to create a logo that people could text. So, you can actually text it with a colon and two posts. And so, we're kind of democratizing an identity system, taking it out of a, you know, a brand portal and li having it live in GitHub a code repository. Interesting. Okay, so I love the logo, by the way. It's so, it's just like very approachable and fun and friendly and everything that you just explained about it, you wouldn't even really grasp that in the first look. So it does kind of exude so much, but within the identity itself, it's, it's very modern and sleek and just approachable. I think that's like one of the most important things, at least what I heard, is like you want this thing to be more digestible to the public eye or to the design eye or whomever and it definitely betrays that so you definitely got me in there <laughs> all right okay, we got jasmine in there amazing I, I think another thing to think about is um a lot of smart home adoption was coming out of china and so when we thought of do we put the mark on the left side of the word mark or the right side of the word mark we thought oh it's interesting because language is becoming so much more pictographic with emojis. Mm -hmm. So what if the mark almost behave more like an emoji yeah. than it did, like a traditional lockup? And so that's why we put the little um, kind the of smiley, smiley face, face to the, the right side as a nod to how language is shifting and how you know we shouldn't be preferencing the West over the East. I love that. Now this is like a weird nitpicky thing. So yes. the two lines, is that a smile or is it a smirk? Well, the funny thing <laughs> was is that as we were presenting it to the CEO of the Zigbee Alliance and uh, my design team said, you know, it looks like a face. Yeah. And I said, we're presenting to a group of engineers. No one called a face. It's a, it's a structural stack. No! <laughs> and then we got into the meeting no. and we showed it and they go, oh, it's a face. I love it. And I totally like, see oh, a hallelujah. face. Hallelujah. And I was like, of course it's a face. Yeah. We all love faces. Oh, bless the yes, engineers. Exactly. <laughs> Hi, Kita. Oh, my gosh. So nice to see you. And Tim. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You guys are just. I love you guys. You guys are so cool. We see them all the time. Yeah, like, may the, the yeah. May the fourth be with you, Munir. <laughs> um, okay, so rewind. Yes. So I want to know personally. Yes. What has been? I mean, you've done a lot. I mean, you worked at Interbrand. You've kind of built this platform with Wolf Allens. You have so many accolades. Um, you got your MFA from, um, that's you, you got your BA from Cornell, or BS yes. from Cornell, yes. and human... Human development. Human development. Oh, yeah. that's very interesting. Human development, and then you got your MFA from Yale. Yes. Like, holy cow. Um, so, I mean, with all of this success, and, and I'm sure a lot of it is like both career and personal, professional success, what has been like the cherry on top of everything? And it doesn't have to be related to Wolf Allens, doesn't have to be related directly to your career. It could be something completely internal, but what's that? Oh, that this one's easy. So thing. it was, it was, uh, it was getting married. So, oh, um, so yeah, sweet. so my wife, Jane, <laughs> who may be watching. Hi, uh, Jane. Hi, Jane. Uh, we got married on February 2nd, which is Groundhog Day, which is my favorite movie of all time. Really? And so we got married on Groundhog Day and in the middle of a very turbulent project. And mm -hmm. I think that is for sure the, the high mark for me in the last five years. And what do we love about Jane? Uh, well, Jane's also a designer. Um, very what cool. I love about her is she stays incredibly grounded. I have a tendency sometimes to get swept away by ideas and vision, and she's the one that kind of um, puts, it, puts it back down into a way that uh, can be uh, dealt with. And so I feel like it's a kind of a fire and ice combo. I love that. It's kind of like those, um, they have those creativity, like self-assessment tests. So yes. it's like, you're kind of like the dreamer and she's like, what is it? Not the realist, but you know, the, the other, No, I like, think that's a good way to put it. Right? It's, it's kind of like, okay, let's uh, come down, hot air balloon. <laughs> bring it down, bring it down. <laughs> exactly. All right, we got to be practical exactly. about this. Um, oh my God, this is awesome. Um, where is 99U? Um, it is in New York. So we are on the East Coast. 
East Coast. East. Where are you from, actually? So I was originally born in San Diego. Uh, Me too. Oh, 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 oh we can. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So some people recount that I wash up off the Pacific Ocean in a shell, but oh, I think yeah, that's I think totally. that's, a, that's a myth. But um, <laughs> but I uh, you know I, I was in San Diego until I was two, and then I spent. Uh, I was in kind of National City and in Canto. Okay. And then okay. I moved to Cambridge when I was two. So oh, my mom wow. took me across the country. And then uh, I bounced around in New England, the Midwest. I think I've lived in 12 cities, which I think when you're younger, it's it's terrifying. When you're older, you're no, no longer thrown by strange scenarios. Oh, yeah, you I'm see sure. everyone as somebody who's a future friend. What's been the best stop, or what was the best stop? Oh, man. I would say probably um, momentarily living in the Bahamas. Um, That's a party, like, every day. Well, it wasn't a party because what, what I had to do was I had to coordinate with an artist who was trying to get a five-ton block of ice from the North Pole what? to NASA, and I was tasked with doing the, the book for the exhibition. Wow. And so um, I was literally just waiting for the ice to come. So my job was to wait for the ice and to think about what kind of book would this represent. How long I, did you wait? Uh, ooh, it was a while. The dean, the then dean of the School of Art called in uh, a friend of his um, at FedEx, and FedEx was able to um, pick up this block of ice, FedEx it, a five-ton block of ice. FedEx a block of ice? Apparently there's, a, there's, wow. a, there's a frozen shipping container cargo unit that they have. Shout out to yeah, FedEx. FedEx. Making the up. impossible Woo. possible. So they FedExed it from the North Pole to Miami and we had a ferry to go to the Bahamas. That was probably the most bizarrely interesting It's very stint. bizarre, but such a great story. You basically like babysat a giant thing of ice from the north. And I welcomed it down. I was like, come on ice, you can do it. Oh my god. How long did it take? <laughs> it took, a, I mean, the ice literally stayed up there for probably over a year and it was wow. preserved in sawdust until mm -hmm. we could figure out a logistics solution because how do you move a five ton block of ice from the North Pole? I mean, I didn't, I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, who thinks of that? <laughs> <laughs> like, who, who is um, in their bed at night thinking, all right, so how are we going to do this? We're going to go to the North Pole, we're going to saw down this ice. <laughs> right, totally. It's like, maybe we cut it down to small ice cubes and maybe like, we like, could ship it. Smaller, the like, factor. 10 yeah. pound cubes and then, then we could transfer it that way. Yeah, exactly. Oh, man, that is kind of mm -hmm. crazy. So I think, yeah, Bahamas for sure. Bahamas. Okay, so where do you live now? Well, we don't have to tell the people if you don't want to tell the people. Oh, Just San kidding. Diego! Hey. hey, San Diego! Guys, this thread is so amazing. Uh, so, Christina, the ice was for an exhibit called uh, The Distance Between What We Have and What We Want, and it was a sculptor named Tavares Strawn, who's Bahamian. And so the ice was a, a commentary it. around, um, obviously, climate change, but also um, he wanted to show his elementary school, um, they had never seen ice at that scale because they had never ventured out. And so the idea of what it meant to be a Bahamian explorer was also part of the, part of the work. Check out, oh, your portfolio is already being shared. Hello. So, <laughs> so one could say winter is coming. Oh my goodness. I love you guys it. are too good. That was really funny. I don't even watch, but I know that. That's the only thing I know. I think a swimming pool, definitely a swimming pool. I think there was enough <laughs> ice to definitely for all this group to have a good, a good swim. Nice. A good swim. Good, big, big Olympic sized pool? Uh, May, uh, roughly? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I second that question. Ice for mojitos. Yes, we are always having a nice time on the chat. Yes, I it love it. It doesn't matter where we are. Hi, Anita. Um, okay, so let's talk about the design community. So there's, you're kind of in the middle of all of these different areas of design, but bringing in like graphic designers, UX designers, um, systems, designers, like what is the thing that kind of binds them all together and how, how do you effectively work together? Because I feel like designers are such like proud and sometimes like presumptuous and you know, we, we all have our things yes. and we all have our things that we're proud of. How do we all collectively work together and value each other's skills? Well, I think the designers have almost, it, it's like, 
they've like fallen in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So it's like the first time you tell your parents you're going to art school, and they're like, oh, oh. yeah, they're like, no, 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 no. And they go to art school, and then all of a sudden, like designers are like kind of the the, the red herrings of the art school. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you are the applied arts people, not the fine arts people. And then you go into the professional world, and oftentimes you may be at the bottom of a totem pole, either in seniority, or it might be a, you know, like a strategist or somebody else, another kind of function or planner. Yeah. So a designer is like, well, what's, what's my role and what's my say? And so one is, I think, giving designers a sense of agency, mm -hmm. that what you have is enough, and actually there are skills you yeah. can build on, soft skills. Yeah. But I think painting a picture of team success that isn't too disciplinary specific. So mm -hmm. what does this look like from a UX perspective? What does this look like from a UI perspective? What types of ways can we lend success yeah. that it can address both the user but also the needs of the business? And I would say that you know our field, and I think you put it, I, I'm in the middle of what I would call the, the most dysfunctional 4 by 100 relay. <laughs> so you start off with a management consultant, and they're like, yeah. okay, this is your total addressable market. This is your white space. Here's your PDF. Brand strategist takes the PDF yep. and goes, okay, I need to figure out what audience we're speaking to and what's the proposition, right, that they'll, they'll appeal to them. Okay. And the designer oftentimes then is paint by numbers mm -hmm. inside of three territories to give to advertising to basically scale it with a media markup. And so each of the legs of the relay race almost believes that they're the most important leg of the race. Yes. So you have this outsized <laughs> self-emphasis on their own leg of the race, which yes. leads to botched handoffs. And so all these yes. baton drops. And so then Gosh. it's like, well, how, what is a relay that feels holistic and mm -hmm. selfless? And so I think that's ultimately what I try to, I try to imagine this, this relay working and perfect baton passes. And yeah. it's not about one racer, it's about the team, team victory. Yeah, and how do you accomplish that like grounded teamwork? Like everybody's kind of got to be on the same wavelength the same work ethic, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of what makes, it brings it together because it's not even about the race itself sometimes. Yes. It's about keeping that composure, working well together, being able to read each other, and then that's how you win. And I'm not a runner, but my sister would probably attest to this, but. <laughs> I agree, I yeah. agree, and give her a shout out. Hi, sister. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of them, so I don't want to go through like the eight names and just be like, shout out, shout out, shout out. But totally, I'll do that. Hi, sisters, hello. <laughs> Love you guys. Yeah. Um, okay, oh, it's chat and win time. You guys, it's chat and win time. So make sure you start chatting it up because we have a really cool prize this time. Um, we are doing a custom Tatley tattoo kit. And fun fact, Tatley is based out of Brooklyn, New York. Um, and we're here in New York and you're gonna look cool with your fly tattoos. Couldn't show mine, but start start chatting. Do you have tattoos? I'm gonna get one today. No, you're not. Well, I mean a temporary one. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. We'll talk about the other one later. Maybe I'll get you. Yeah. All right, you guys, start, start. And this is when the chat. Just I starts. love all the. Who? Oh my gosh, the vibranium is amazing in I here. Know, we're just like anyway, Wakanda. Okay, cool. All right, what were you saying? I'm sorry. We're waiting for the winner. Oh. Who's gonna have, you're gonna have a matching tattoo with this person. Ooh, tat me come up. On, come on, Rice come on, come on. is looking pretty, wow. Well, well, you guys are slowing down. What's happening? Who is the winner? Who is the winner? Who is the winner? John! <laughs> oh, I was like, oh, is John? It John Olsen, I know John Olsen. Hi, John. Come on, guys, who's the winner? Keep going. Also, Keep John, going. you did a great job on your live session. Hi, Lena. Di Dioga Costa. Dioga Costa? You're the winner! Congratulations! You're gonna have a matching tattoo with Forrest, and it's gonna be awesome. We're all gonna get bicep Yeah, we're gonna do like a Rose the Riveter thing oh, going yeah. on. Like, like a little this. Chief, totally. And my grandmother actually was the real Rosie the Riveter, so I always find funny when no. I when I see that. Yeah, she was a Riveter for General Dynamics in San Diego, what? and she was the top Riveter. And so when I see the Rosie the Riveter, we can do it. I'm like, that should be my grandmother. But also, my grandmother is actually was better looking than Rosie was. Ooh. But you know, she was, she was a catch. Wow, it's it's weird because I've met a lot of people from San Diego that have some weird fun facts. About it's their a family. very straight border cities have interesting. Yeah, I have Tales. two random ones. One on my mom's side that um, we're related to Mary Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's wife. Okay. 
very strange, but I milked that as long as I could in school. Yes. Um, and the second one I probably won't mention because it's really weird, but. Yeah, yeah. it'll be offline after the tattoo. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, can, oh, you guys are so supportive. Dioga, you're gonna show us your tattoos, right? When you get your, your pack, we wanna see your sleeve going on. Make sure we're all matching. So I want to ask you about, so in 2017, you did this blog post about, I think you did a talk in China and it's around diversity as a competitive advantage. Yes. And as someone who is always trying to be a diversity advocate, can you tell me about that and like where, like where that came from and what inspired that conversation? Yes, I actually, um, Paco, can I switch to my screen again? I have a, uh, I have up. a, <laughs> so elephant. this is an elephant. <laughs> uh, I think it's the easiest way to explain to people just some of the intricacies and to try to answer your question mm -hmm. about diversity. So there's this ancient uh, kind of cone or riddle um, about these six blind monks that encounter an elephant. Mm -hmm. And they're all trying to understand the true nature of an elephant. And so there's one that is you know, hugging the leg and says, oh, it's a tree. So one is underneath the belly of the elephant, they said, it's clearly a boulder, I mean, it's a clearly a spherical mass. Mm -hmm. Someone's holding the trunk and thinking it's a serpent, someone's holding a tail and thinking that it's some kind of paintbrush. And so they're all kind of bickering about the true nature of the elephant. But all of them are partially right and partially wrong. Right. And it's only through sincere conversations can you arrive at a holistic understanding. And so you might have to have a short person that's at the leg, a taller person who can reach the top of the head. And so it's about thinking about cognitive diversity as well as just pure DNI from race and gender. It's like, um, is there somebody who's not able-bodied so we don't succumb to ableism? Um, maybe there's somebody that has a specific visual impairment to make sure that the colors have enough contrast. And so I think if we can up-level and say our team should be so cognitively diverse, because at least in America, that's gonna be our saving grace. Um, is going to be the, actually the diversity of our country is going to be what is going to propel innovation, which I don't think people understand yet. I think diversity yeah. is still in a kind of like a, we need to make it right, but actually thing. it is a competitive advantage that yeah. America has that no other nation has. So how do you tell that story with Wolf Allens, um, especially with clients like Uber, Finery29? I feel like those are really great platforms to tell that story. So how do you incorporate that like from the get-go in the brief and try to encourage these companies to embrace it and push through? You know, I think um, in, it, as long as we're in the realm of kind of aspirational capitalism, I think it ultimately has to be a bottom line decision. And I think, you know, I always tell designers, um, the image of a polar bear on a melting piece of ice. Guys, we have to stop this. It's not working. <laughs> it's a failure of imagination. We need better imagery. We actually need things that will work. And so ultimately, if we truly are invested in climate change and some of these things, we'll go through all of our paces to figure out what is the image that will trigger action. It may not be a polar bear on a melting piece of ice. I mean, I love it personally, mm -hmm. but that's maybe not gonna drive a barren of industry to convert to a green HVAC system or for somebody to look at biomanufacturing and their supply chain. So it's, I think it's understanding how to occupy and inhabit oppositional perspectives mm -hmm. and then figure out what is the seduction angle to bridge those things. And I think um, it's being comfortable kind of stepping outside of your normal kind of tribal silo yeah. into something that's like, well, if I really want to solve this, I might have to go into the heart of darkness. Nice. I mean, I, you have to, really, to kind of come out of that thinking outside of the box, right? Interesting perspective on diversity. Yes, really awesome. The chat win is over. Oh, I'm sorry your stream is lagging. Next time. We'll have more along um, the next few days. So, I think when I read that, you spoke about that in China. Yes. And so, why, why that, it was a, it was a conference, correct? Yes, yes. So, why that, why that conversation, how did that spark there, and what kind of enabled that, and then what was, what was the reaction from that? Well, I think it's interesting. I, I think, um, one, uh, all the Americans that happened to be at that specific conference were always pleasantly reminded that we are so far behind China in innovation. Mm -hmm. I think there's a sense of being in San Francisco where you think we're, 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 we're at the epicenter of innovation, uh -huh. then you go to China and you're like, 
Wow. Okay. All right. We'll, is, we'll this slow is, this our roll. This is actually uh, <laughs> innovation at pace. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the conversations are around how the population density of China is leading to more sophisticated AI and machine learning. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, what is America's competitive advantage if it's not population density, if we're not looking at metropolitan areas? And ultimately, it would be the diversity of the people. Yeah. And it's about embracing diversity of people and the openness of embracing everyone into this country that it's really, you know, it's like immigrants get the job done. Like, that's literally what I think is uh, it's going to save us. <laughs> yeah, I'll, totally. Um, we should open it up to questions. Does anyone have questions in the chat? This is your time. It is up to you. Let's see. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Roxanne. Anyone have any questions? You guys were so active. We've, we're looking a little stagnant. Okay, hold on. I think I think I know what to do. What, what do we got to do? Hold on, hold on. I'm gonna okay. go below. I'm gonna go below desk, and I'm gonna do another high leg kick. Oh yeah. Hold on, hold on. Wait for it, thread. Hold on. All right. Drum roll. Woo! All, all right. right. Are we? All right. Where's okay. The all right. All right. <laughs> oh yay! <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have questions for Forrest? Or is it too early for you guys? We're, we're ready. To, oh, here we go. Here you go. Hi, Roxanne again. Good morning. Yay. Oh, no. I think that they're a little laggy. I think that's why we're a little, we're a little slow. But that's OK. You've been asking phenomenal questions. So I, if you want to ask yeah. another one, I, I will totally gladly answer yeah. it. And maybe it'll address okay, you know, maybe, some of these things. Yeah. Tim, that's a great question. Maybe the peeps will come back. Um, Let's talk about awards. Awards, awards, cans, cans. Cans gold, dude. That's like, that's, you know, the Olympics of creative, like of everything, really. Talk about it. Well, and I, what, what was the win? What was it like? Yeah, I know it's interesting. You know, awards are, I think, a blessing and a curse. I always think that um, it's important for designers to understand what goes into the award show process, mm -hmm. uh, but ultimately that you should feel like whatever your work is, is gold medal worthy all along the way. And I think that awards are in some ways just an indication that somebody else recognizes it. Yeah. I think that um, sometimes people, I think, try to engineer something for award shows, like we're gonna make this for an award show. Yeah. And I think that that's the type of work that contributes to, I think, the designers supporting the myth of more. Make make more to win awards, make more to chase novelty. And I mm -hmm. think that if, um, if the teams focus more on the work at hand, they'll be more successful in award shows. Yeah. But also, it's a great opportunity for designers to practice articulating. You know, what is the brief? A lot of times you see on visual blogs, there's never a mention of the brief. So designers are commenting on form factors and typography decisions, but not did you meet the needs of you know what the client was asking for? And I yeah. think for designers to get a bigger seat at the table, um, we need to start incorporating briefs and what is the problem you're trying to solve so that we understand how design is actually a valuable problem solution tool. Yeah, I think that's it's very impactful to tell that end of the process. I think, yeah, I, I don't notice that it's, you know, we miss that. And that's like the very beginning. That's where it all begins. That's where the ideation starts. So I think it's important to kind of speak on that and what are the challenges to knowing your client, understanding the need, and then executing it effectively. So that, that's a good call. OK, so you asked, OK, second question. Yes. You asked, what, what was it for? Yes. Um, so we were working on a commemorative poster for um, Nelson Mandela's birthday. Wow. And um, his health declined, and ultimately he ended up passing. And so we wanted to make a commemorative poster for his life. And the limitations of the original poster um, program was an A2 poster size. Mm -hmm. And so we thought, well, that's an interesting format. Mm -hmm. um, but if we really want to celebrate his life, I mean, his life was about being a source of light and optimism in the most darkest and dreary prison cell in Robben Island. Mm -hmm. And so we actually measured the prison cell of Robben wow. Island. And we figured out a way to fold an A2 poster to the exact footprint of the prison cell. Wow. And so um, people you know, were taking pictures of themselves standing on top of the poster and saying a person spent an inordinate amount of time in this, in this confined space, yeah. but ultimately the poster was bright. And so it was about uh, light, uh, light overcoming dark and dreary. And so that was what was awarded. That's so powerful. 
I need to find that. I need to see that visually. Um, Tim had a question about, I think he said, self-taught artist versus Tim, education. you're asking amazing questions. And I, yeah. Tim, I've been tracking all of your questions, so don't so worry. Good. Uh, so Tim, the first question I think you had was basically self, the self-taught. And I think mm -hmm. there's, um, our design profession is evolving in a interesting way. And I think that um, it's putting a certain kind of tension on um, should design education be like vocational preparedness? Like should all designers learn how to code? Should learn these kind of software skills to be competitive towards a market that's kind of up-leveling the importance of these skills? Or should the purpose of design education be to learn how to think? Mm -hmm. um, cause, because maybe we can't prepare for the situations we'll be in. It's like a mixed reality brief and we had to figure out what the heads-up display is doing and how would you prepare for that in art school? And so I think it's a bit of a blend. I think that all designers need to task themselves with doing self-directed work right. to understand what is their place of passion. Because sometimes, even in our design education, you're following someone else's passion. You're following your professor's passion. You're following, you know, maybe doing a lot of collaborative projects. Mm -hmm. But just really understand what you're passionate about and freeze that and understand who are your heroes that you admire uh, throughout time that have supported that. Who are the people that oppose that? So you understand your own kind of design constitution. But then I think, back to your second question, do you ever have to fire a client? And so I always tell designers, there's the, the TTL rule. So every client engagement, when you meet them, you should say, does this person have taste? Hmm. Yes, the person does. Does this person <laughs> have trust? If they don't have taste, to trust that I can kind of lead them as, a, as, a, as an expert. Um, and if you don't have taste or trust, you should get deep, deep flags should go up yeah. and, and ultimately that's a sign to go because that's, I showed it to my German Shepherd and my German Shepherd doesn't like the logo. No, I walked away? Yeah, barked. Oh, wow, barked, yeah. that's aggressive. So that's where you, that's where, you know, I think, uh, you know, designers, um, you know, just get swayed by, by indecision. And I think it's important to just to be mindful of the time that you spend. Mm -hmm. Time is so precious. So totally. spend it with, you know, people that are valuing what you're, what you're putting forth. And I really think, Tim, your question is super topical because I think a lot of these things I'm seeing in design education, especially with a lot more international students that are seeing the value of like an American art school education, is the balance of self-taught. You have, designers really need to figure out what they're passionate about. They need to do self-directed projects so they understand, given your own brief, not a client brief or a professor brief, what would you make if you could make anything for the rest of your life? And I think it's important that all designers can answer that. Someone had a follow-up question to Tim. So, a degree versus like online education programs like lynda.com, Udemy, Skillshare. What do you think the value is um, for or against those systems against a degree or if a degree is more valuable than those systems? What do you think? Where do we stand with that? Well, I'm very excited by a lot of, you know, whether it's MITx or a lot of programs that are basically looking at free education. Um, I think that's one of the things that our country doesn't get right. I think mm -hmm. Cooper Union go Cooper Union, um, in terms of thinking about free art school education, because I think you're truly getting the most qualified candidates who then are not saddled with debt. And I think this is, this is incredibly important um, to not feel that, you know, art school is at the risk of, you know, five years or seven years of, of struggle. Um, and so I think, yeah, um, Tim, Tim's just on a, on a, on a roll. <laughs> Carrie, thank you so much. Um, so in terms of Josh's point about aspirational capitalism, I think it's important just to think about if you know that you're working with publicly traded companies or giant unicorns, you understand that, unfortunately, the bottom line is going to be what people are looking at. And so you can use that as a design tactic. You know, if you are working with a duopoly, whether it's, you know, a Lyft and Uber or a pair, a pair you can say, I want to raise the conversation of accessibility for both of these companies because I know that they're, they're so competitive that if I, raise, if I raise one ship, then I can raise both ships. And so I think it's important to understand the, the, the realm in which you're operating in and the ways in which you can actually utilize those as design levers. Kita has a really cool question. So she says she's passionate about what she does, but not necessarily about people. So where does she stand in the job market and you know, just being a creator? So I think, um, Kita, you're probably one of the few people that's actually telling the truth. I think if you look at of why so, so much tech has gone wrong, it's people actually don't truly care about people. 
like they kind of care. And we're in this kind of kind of care moment in time where we need to like truly care about people if we're gonna say we care about people. But I actually feel that um, focusing on yourself in a truly intentional way, understanding what, um, what a successful project looks like for yourself, what is interesting to you guys, and ultimately um, you know, what, what that feels like is incredibly important. Um, and so I think that most designers should have that internal compass. If they don't have the internal compass, then um, you're gonna be swayed by the forces of client trajectory, you know, kind of um, the turbulence of a competitive landscape. And so I think that um, all designers should be asking the same question you did, which is, what am I passionate about? And before I think about solving the world's problems, what am I passionate about? Right. So when I actually am plugged in, I can deliver the goods. What well, makes me tick, right? You guys have some great questions. Ty wants to know, um, choosing a potential client, how do you know when you're choosing a potential client? How do you know when they're right for you? And I think that kind of goes back to what we just talked about, yeah. right? Your passion, so whatever makes you tick. Taste, trust, or leave. Taste, trust, or leave. Ah, nice. It's a little acronym, a little TTL. TTL. If you don't have taste or trust, you gotta look for the door. Yes. Jessica says, how do you deal with designer burnout? We all have to deal with it. It's so rough sometimes. If you're really pushing, um, and design is such a young discipline, mm -hmm. that burnout can happen from so many different vantage points. Burnout can happen from, have we run out of references because our design discipline is so young? Mm -hmm. It can be burnout in terms of, you know, kind of keeping up with, you know, a competitive landscape. Mm -hmm. It can be burnout in terms of, I'm just not interested in the stuff that I'm making. Yeah. It doesn't excite yeah. me anymore. And I think the best thing for designers to do is to not look at design. I think that we are overwhelmed. Like, we literally see more beautiful things than anyone has seen in, like, the history of time. Like, literally, probably today, I'll see more beautiful images than a human, like, in 1960, maybe saw their entire life. Wow. Right? That's just on Instagram, that might be on stage, that might be in a conversation, that might mm -hmm. be with something on your phone. Yeah. It's like, how do we deal with, like, 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 we're seeing, like, beauty that might have taken 10 years to arrive to a, a mountaintop or, or a summit. Um, and I think that these conditions, you know, force us to, um, think about what ultimately we are striving for because burnout may be, I can't keep up with the amount of references that are coming through on my Slack and my DM, but to avoid burnout, go to an art gallery, yes. go to a museum. My best inspiration comes from looking at cracks in the sidewalk and imagining <laughs> the pavement and the formation of the concrete and the condition of it says so much about a neighborhood. So I think all of these are subtle, subtle cues that inspiration doesn't necessarily have to be the visual blog. Oh my gosh, have you seen this? And like the like, whoa, like head exploding moment. Maybe those subtle and quiet moments. And I think, um, the, unfortunately, I think beauty is part of the problem. We're seeing too many beautiful things. We're like, how can I possibly make so many beautiful things? And also I'm looking at too many visual references that are design solutions. So how to just box that and to say, what is beauty from a different perspective, from an adjacent discipline? Is TTL a trademark? TTL is not trademark. People but are loving it. We need to talk to legal. Yeah, we're gonna have to work that out. Thank you, Paco. <laughs> um, how, as an in-house designer, do you not stay stagnant? And that is a hard question. I think a lot of us that work at these big tech companies, even you know, in-house at an agency, or like really across all of the industries where design is a very key portion of the business, how do you get out of that? I think that uh, stagnation is going to be an incredibly difficult thing to wrestle with, especially as we deal with hyper-specialization. So I tell designers, when you're coming to the West Coast, you kind of have to get a totally different playbook for operating. Mm -hmm. So you're presenting to engineers, you're not presenting to marketers. You're presenting to engineers, they want to understand, well, how are you going to test this? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. How are the metrics going to inform whether this is a valid solution? Um, engineers are also trained to make sure that things are resilient, they don't fall down, which is a good thing. Like a bridge shouldn't fall down if you're driving on it. Uh, but ultimately, um, that means that you don't believe in renaissance people. You want Specialists. I want a bridge specialist so the bridge doesn't fall down. I want an aviation specialist so the mm -hmm. plane gets to its destination. And so um, if you come in saying, 360 branding, we can do <laughs> smell and scent and touch, and they're yeah. like, no, 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 you no, can't. Like, no, 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 no. And then there's the teardown, which is, is this proof valid? 
Yeah. And it feels like you're being attacked, mm. but it's actually, I just want to make sure this bridge is going to stand up. Yeah. And so it's a, it's a reframe, but ultimately um, I find, now I find this to be the best type of feedback, which feels um, more transparent, more direct, and, and more honest. And so I think um, it took a while to get it, to kind of adjust to the kind of engineering way of working. But I think in terms of stagnation, the first task is how is the designer going to communicate with a different type of audience? Mm -hmm. That's the first thing from designer to designer to designer to marketer to designer to engineer or to design ops person. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. But also to think about your goal towards personal mastery. So what do you imagine to be a mastery of skills? Is it about um, you in a room being able to convince somebody to say yes to something? Well, then that sets off these are the skills I need to master. I need to take an improv class. I probably should take a Toastmasters class. Should learn how to breathe. Um, all these things. Um, if that's interesting to you in terms of a trajectory towards mastery. And so I think it's different for every person, but ultimately um, that's what I would suggest. Okay. I'd say let's take one more question and then maybe talk a little bit more about 99 Thank you, U. Carrie. Um, Diogo has an interesting question. Do you think good art gets trivialized in a crowd because there's so much we consume around us every day, like you said? I think so. I also think that we don't do the best jobs of, uh, of giving credit. <laughs> so yes. oh I think God. in our, uh, our kind of bounce back uh, mm -hmm. DM culture, we are basically cycling images either through mood boards or inspiration mm -hmm. without saying, Social media. yeah, who, who is the who, who authored this? No. Like, who is who painted this? And so I think, first off, it's just like literally, who's the person that made this thing? Mm -hmm. And then if I understand who made the thing, then ultimately, why did they make the thing? Which is another thing that people don't talk about, which exactly. is the brief or the inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, oh, wow, this was inspired by, you know, sitting at a tarmac. Like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Uh, maybe I should, you know, be more mindful I'm on a tar tarmac. Yeah. And so I think part of it is crediting and understanding the source of what's being made is the first thing we can do to try to offset that. Yeah, and that's where, honestly, that feels like more natural in terms of like getting that inspiration. You see something on a screen and yeah, it's beautiful, but how does it resonate with you like internally? And a lot of the times I'm feeling, I'm on Instagram and I'm looking at like these short videos or like beautiful photography and I'm like, what inspired that? Why did that person create this? And you just don't get that context because everything just gets lost sometimes. And so, yeah, I definitely agree with you. It's 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 hard to acknowledge. Your people. name looks so good in typography. I was like, I'm sorry, I'm like, yeah, I was like well, Jasmine, it's such beautiful letters. You anyway. know what? <laughs> when I look at business cards, it is like so annoying. I can never choose. I'm like, ew, it looks gross, like in all type. But so thank you, you. you hit upon something amazingly apropos for this conference, okay. which is the value of context. And so to, to echo the point on. Um, the balance between corporate and self-initiated um, or ultimately about art being lost and the spin cycle of beautiful imagery um, is really thinking about one, um, crediting and understanding the source of inspiration, but that is part of a larger problem of contextual understanding of an idea. And this is you know, a problem with design blogs, right? We start to critique, critique, critique. We don't like it, we don't like it. We love it, we love it, we love it. But what was the brief? What is the context around this design? What were these designers trying to solve? Why did they choose a bubbly typeface? Why did they choose a very angular solution? And I think if designers can provide more contextual cues to what they're doing, it helps everyone, including the non-designers, understand, okay, now I understand how we could view success. Yeah, and that ties into like award seeking, finding that niche that you're passionate about, and dealing with clients when just producing work. Like all of that kind of ties together and pushes you through, pushes your skills through. And so that's all of it. Everything that we talked about today kind of stems off of that. Like, who are you? What do you like to do? What's the context behind it? And then how are you going to push that through the world? So we, we covered a lot. We got really deep in this. Okay, so Thread, you got, what you guys need to understand is Jasmine and I are up here rocking Adobe Live. There's literally a sea of people out here They're going, everywhere. what is this Wakanda show? And it's freaking awesome. You might like, have to do one more leg kick. <laughs> You gotta do the, the bounce. You might have to do one more leg kick. Yeah. Just, okay. All right. Hold on. Hold on. Just for the people. Let me go down. Let me go down. Let me go. Hold on. Right. Hold on. Okay. Woo! All Shoes right. This mic on is on. Point. Boom. All right. We're like right in the thick. Right in the thick of things. I think we got a few more minutes left. 
Um, Tim Brown is going to be here. He's the president and CEO of IDEO. Who are you excited to see? Do you have any old friends around? Well, John Olson. John Olson's watching, so oh, I hope, hey. hope I get to run into John Olson. Um, yeah, meet a us, lot, a lot of very exciting here. people, and also people. Feel free to DM me on Instagram. I know I put it out there for the people that are this dedicated to be on this thread right now. I know. Just feel free to give me a shout right if you have any questions too. about something. So, again, this is about scaling ideas and being helpful. So let me know. Yeah. Um, are you guys? You guys listening to the talks all well all week all, for the next few days let us know who you're excited to see and hear and <laughs> roxanne hear. roxanne is just <laughs> rocking the chat right now she's she looks like great kick thank you thank you sheila Hoxo. hi Hoxo. nice to see you. all these like familiar faces oh christina's coming up with another one purpose okay. passion and vulnerability wow that's a good one wow that's ppb Okay, okay, yeah. okay. Maybe not an acronym. <laughs> not an acronym, but, but you, love it. Love it. Yes. We love the Yes. Everything else about it. <laughs> Asama. Hi everyone. Glad to see all you and friends. Glad to see you too. So are you excited for your master class? Oh my gosh. Yeah, and I was looking through some of the attendees mm -hmm. and it is we have people from in-house teams, from art schools to consultancy. So I'm so excited to get such a blend of different types of practitioners. Um, That's awesome, they gave you that information. I know, it's amazing. That's awesome. So what are, what are we learning? So I think, again, uh, that the future design uh, approach should not be about chasing novelty. It should be making sure the future is about an equitable future that everybody can thrive in. And I Absolutely. think that's the, the big takeaway. And I'll just basically discuss some tricks of the trade, how to navigate. I love it. I love it. People are getting, it's getting really rowdy here. It's getting really <laughs> exciting. Um, I, had, I had a fun little thing um, when I found out I was going to be hosting you. So your yes. first name is Forrest. Yes. My last name is Whitaker. Oh my and gosh, no way. So people always assume I'm related to Forrest Whitaker and I'm like, he's got two T's, I got one. But I was like, oh, so our like, power duo name would be Forrest Whitaker. Guys, this and is a miracle. Like Some Adobe Live Adobe. miracle. Forrest Whitaker, are you kidding me? Is Forrest this happening? Whitaker, if you're listening. Oh man. <laughs> DM us. <laughs> it's so bizarre. I remember I did a book report on Forrest Gump when I was like in really? seventh grade, before it became a movie. And little did I know in 1994 that my life would forever change. Um, and I got no gum jokes came on the thread, really? which is no? amazing. It's sweet faced out. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, but, well, uh, Forces yeah. are, is such Forrest a Whitaker. cool name. Forrest Whitaker is great. We do our collab, Forrest Whitaker. Yeah, maybe we sh you should talk to him. Yeah. I think you guys can yeah. do some cool things. Yeah, we'll see it. A little co-branding. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little, little identity work. Trees that make you weak in the knees. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, my goodness. Yes, focus on what you enjoy. How do I get involved in your master class? Well, Sheila, you have to be at 99U, but maybe Forrest has some interesting resources that he can lead you to uh, via the comfort of your own home. Yeah, no, totally. And I'll, I'll just try to, just send me a DM. Um, my Instagram is mcray, which is E-M-C-R-A-Y. And um, I'd be happy to do a slide share or something. I have to just get it into slide share format. But again, I wanted to just be able to share these ideas with all of you. Absolutely. Um, let's see, good job. I would love to. I just need to pay off. Any last questions? We're in our last minutes, guys. It's been so fun. Yes. 99 U is like, it's already popping. Like, oh my gosh. And Forrest Whitaker is just clearly. Forrest Whitaker, please. <laughs> DM us. Yes. At us. Something. Yes. Do we, so, yes. we need to Amazing. do some collab. High kicks, high kicks. If you're, if you're alone in a room, do a high kick. Even if the kick is not that high, just kick. I want like, to see not? a high kick gif. Yes. Like, come out of this. I think it could happen. And I think we have the people to make it happen. The people. We need you to make it happen. Yeah. With, but they have to be awesome shoes. So some type of glitter. Um, Wait, was Tim talking about don't jinx the collab, the Forrest Whitaker oh, collab? Oh, okay. Knock on wood. Okay, we'll I'm talk very, about it. We'll talk I'm about superstitious. It. Okay. Oh, nice. He's got the Instagram on deck. Thank you, Tim. Nice, nice, nice. So again, we are here live at 99U. I've been here. It's been a pleasure, Forrest. 
And um, up next is Tim Brown, President and CEO of IDEO. So stay tuned and enjoy. Thank you all. Out. It could be live. Out. Forrest Whitaker. <laughs> yeah, <look. laughs>